So uh, that was a fabulous talk. Thank you, um, Thank you very uh, much, Natasha. Well. Now I open the floor for discussion and questions. Who would like to start? Hello, uh, my name is uh, Stan. Um, I'm pretty much a layman. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, correlations with the uh, degree measure at the beginning and the simple measures, um, how many of the, the examples you've got were insights that weren't uh, indicated by the simpler measures, like the example mm. with the, the economics one? Yes. Um, there, there could be greater de uh, degrees with more trust in, in the market, for example, and that might yeah. show the same graph as the graphlet graph, if that's the right way. Yeah, we tested, of course, with all of those simple measures. And you really cannot publish a paper if you don't test uh, with everything else. Uh, and uh, the degree just doesn't cut it. It's a way too simplistic measure uh, to discover, to uncover these phenomena. Um, and there were actually many uh, debates uh, early on in the field of biological networks that were caused by the use of these overly simplistic measures. And uh, many of the big and important labs would arguing through particular papers, uh, there, there were uh, uh, notions of the hub proteins, highly linked proteins being uh, very important for disease, but that was very early on when we had very sparse data, very low confidence data, and once the confidence of the data increased, that uh, uh, showed up to be not really relevant. And also this hubbiness might really mean that we're just more focused on particular, collecting the data in particular parts of these networks that we care about. Uh, and there would be more data, even economic data, about Germany or, uh, or the US than about Rwanda, for example, or Sierra Leone, right? Uh, and it's the same uh, in, in the biological domain, where basically we are focused on studying cancer or particular diseases, so we are heavily analyzing particular parts. And this is why these, the degree of these proteins is very high, and not really because it's high, uh, uh, that, that is the true signal, but it's just because we didn't look at the parts of the network where we think there is nothing, but actually there is something there, it's just we didn't have enough money or time to look there. Yeah. Uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate it. I am working on similar similar domain, which is more into intelligence. Uh, intelligence, we receive data from various sources. A mm -hmm. lot of data comes in we form similar patterns of uh, what we call entities and link, you call it node. Yep. It's, it's exactly the same concept. Um, just wanted to know, um, when you have a link, that could be confirmed or non-confirmed? That could, sorry? Confirmed link or non-confirmed links. Uh-huh. So confirmed yes. is something which you definitely know it happens mm -hmm. or occurs. A non-confirmed is it's not really you don't know whether it's there or not, but it does impact overall yes. networking. Yes. And other thing is when you receive data, when you measure data from various uh, mechanisms or sources, there is something called grading, data grading. Data grading? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that again impacts your analysis when yes. you perform. Mm -hmm. so have you done similar? Yes. Yes, thank you for your question. It's a wonderful question. Basically, it's about reliability of data. And the same thing like you have in your intelligence uh, work, we have in biology. For some of these connections, we are pretty certain they happen. And for some of them, they might be true or they might be false. So our data is very, very noisy. Whatever I showed you tonight is robust to noise. And it's our job to make sure that all of these methods are robust to noise, meaning that they will give the same results in the presence of quite a lot of noise. And I apologize, I did not have the time to cover that aspect as well, but definitely that is something that we take into account. Whenever you deal with any data, there is a lot of noise, uh, but this, even in the presence of noise, you can discover uh, uh, the true signal and you can discover things, yes. Thanks for the question, very good question. Dr. Ganesh Lal from the University of York. Uh, if you would excuse me, I have two questions. One is a very short one. Uh, most of your networks are correlation networks, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a correlation network, mm -hmm. in order to predict the presence of an edge, you would have had a cut of value. So did you use the canonical value of 0.05 or did you have any, or did you have some other cutoff value? No, no, we did not use any of that. There are no cutoff values, everything is there. Um, um, so for example, in um, protein interaction networks, 
uh, to uh, there are other people who study the confidence of the data. Okay, so there, there are very sophisticated methods. Some of Igor's, for example, that just got published on Monday this week in Nature Methods about the reliability of the data. So we take high confidence data to extract the, the, the true signal. So we don't really do, deal, deal with those things. And the correlation networks that I've shown you, I mean, these are correlations between uh, those columns and we just compare them. We, we don't have cutoff values. We just take them all and you know compare matrices. And yeah. second one would be your examples are eukaryotic wherein genes are individual entities? Sorry, so if, the, exam, exam? Uh, the examples that you showed, mm -hmm. they're from um, higher organisms, eukaryotes. Yes, eukaryotes. So wherein the genes are individual entities, so you can consider them as nodes. But in bacteria, you mm -hmm. have them as clusters, like mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. operons. Mm -hmm. So in such a case, would you consider the entire operon as a node, or would you consider them as linked nodes? Um, we have not really analyzed those networks much, so we did not deal with those issues. But it's a good thing. I mean, there are, uh, there is a lot of work on these pathogen uh, interacting proteins between bacteria and humans. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I cannot answer that question because we did not analyze those organisms. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We got um, graphlet. We got the graphlet, and what does it mean mathematically? to be a good set of graphlets, uh -huh. because mm -hmm. you've, you're certainly not minimal, you're mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. wanting some to impact on mm -hmm. others. In a 3D network, I was going, why aren't you having 3D graphlets? And mm -hmm. you know, you, you've mm -hmm. got these graphlets, you're building these shapes that can also be thought of as mm -hmm. more complex graphlets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. How does one yes. make, th yeah. how does one say when you've got a good choice? Right, yeah, yeah, we, we did uh, uh, address that in several of our papers. Uh, these are not really 3D. I mean, graphs are much more dimensional. They're, they're multidimensional things. So graphlets are also multidimensional. And now the question is, what is the minimal set or what is the good set? And we tested that uh, uh, empirically. So we went up to six node graphlets. So if you increase the number of graphlets past a certain point, you're not getting more. Um, and there are many reasons for that. One of the reasons is that these networks are called, well, many of the real world networks are so-called small world, right? Meaning that they have a small diameter. So for example, we've all heard probably of six degrees of separation. From any person on the planet through uh, uh, friendships, you can get on, to any other person on the planet on average in six hops, okay? Through six links, okay? So you don't need to go too far. Okay, so five is plenty because with five you go uh, pretty far around your protein of interest or your node of interest, okay? Now actually what it turns out is that even four is enough because of these dependencies, and so you remove redundancies, you, you don't uh, uh, worry about that, but because of these dependencies, um, if you're going to higher order graphlets, these dependencies will blur a picture a little bit. So you get more from fewer from four node ones than from five node ones. And there is more work on that, but I think in short that, that would be the answer. But a great question, thank you very much. Can we abstract all the biological functioning, functioning of a cell or living system completely into uh, mathematical abstraction with graph theory? But, mm -hmm. Mm. by decoupling the underlying chemistry and biology and physics completely? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> we don't know that. <laughs> so basically, uh, yeah, I mean, what is this biochemical space of these entities? How can we do that? I mean, we are making some steps towards that, but uh, it is difficult. I don't think anybody knows an answer to that. This is a very abstract theoretical question. Yeah, thank you. We, we can maybe discuss more over, uh, over the drinks. Hi, I'm Ben Chamberlain, Imperial College. I've got uh, two questions. Has there been any work done on extending this to edges that aren't just binary? So I guess in the trade network, all, all um, edges aren't equal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So weights on edges, basically. Exactly, yeah. weighted edges. Probabilities, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. We are working on it, yes. We are extending these methods. Of course, there are many other people working on different methods uh, with, with these probabilities, but yes, uh, one of my students who is actually here is currently uh, uh, working on that, yes. Great, and then my second question is, is there any effort to assign sort of deeper meanings to the various graphlets, or are they simply mathematical objects? Uh, yes. Uh, 
so basically, which are the specific ones, right? What, what do they mean, right? Yeah. So one of the things is uh, in these economic networks, we figured out these brokerage positions, for example. So that's one of the ways to do that. Now, perhaps you're trying to say, like, which of these ones are the important ones? Can you disregard the others? I'm not sure about that. Uh, perhaps there are some that are more important than others, but that is ongoing research. But a good one, good, good question. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Raul Goff. Um, I have a question. Do you, are you aware of anybody applying these techniques to uh, brain research or neural networks? <laughs> yes, our group. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to tell us something about that? Uh, okay. Uh, so this... Ha. So in brain research, uh, we just recently obtained uh, large data sets, kind of systems level data sets with a big NIH funded project in the US. There is a lot of data available, about 1,000 healthy individuals. Uh, so we are currently working on this data. Basically, uh, there are uh, uh, large networks of anatomical connectivity and also functional connectivity plus uh, many of the other uh, phenotypic uh, features of, of these individuals. So I have a master's student right now who is working uh, on, on basically trying to integrate this and, and figure out what it means. And of course, uh, in our department, we have Professor Daniel Ruckert, who is collecting, currently he has a large project on collecting uh, these data of actually unborn babies with some problems, and these data are slowly becoming available, and we will work uh, with him to, to analyze that. Uh, but yeah, there was some... Uh, mm, some very simple types of analysis started appearing on these available data, but we feel that there is much more that can be done, and we're beginning to work on those issues as well. Sean Barker. Is there any work done yet on, uh, once you understand the network, I'm thinking of social networks, people actually then using the knowledge of the network to change the network to something that gives them a result they want? Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Huh. Once you know something, like that, then I, I'm not aware of such manipulations, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know about that. Uh, I, I'll ask one more question on mm -hmm. uh, one of the scenario, wherein maybe I don't know whether you applied it or not. Just need to know if you, if you have applied that scenario, how. So, for example, if there's a crime happening, a crime happens, try to analyze, because it happened because of certain events before it. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, and the events are consequence of certain links or formation mm -hmm. over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those links are formed, once we identify the link, we need to know the behavior, how behavior has changed because of that link, and that was uh, resulted in the crime. Mm -hmm. so anything similar has been done in identifying how diseases in a human being are actually happens over a period of time. If you go by a timeline, right. you can see the change in the links happening between. Yes, yes, yes. There are methods uh, for that. Uh, we particularly have not analyzed any crime networks. Uh, but uh, a colleague of mine, Des Hayam from Strathclyde University, has developed techniques uh, exactly to analyze those types of data. In particular, he analyzes Twitter and how people tweet of particular events, but you know what precedes what. But I think that would be applicable in, in the in the domain that you mentioned as well. So I would look him up if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, Abhijit Kirsch, Imperial College. Uh, so, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, you have this vocabulary of graphlets, uh, is it domain specific and do you have to build different ones for different domains like economics mm -hmm. uh, versus medicine or is it just graph theory and it just works uh, on any data? Right, it is not domain specific, uh, so it is a general vocabulary that can, you can apply in, in any domain. However, for each domain you really need to have an expert in that particular domain who will point you to the right data and intricacies of the data and the right problems and often actually uh, you want to design methods particular for those data because these are all heuristics and the main feature of heuristics is every heuristic will fail, guaranteed, will fail on a particular example. So 
If you can, your best bet is to design heuristics for a particular application, because then they can be the best, the fastest, and things like that. But then to do that, then you really need to know all the intricacies of the data. And this is why, actually, so far, we've been working mainly on the biological domain, and only recently we started expanding in economic networks. But that, that's a great question. So it is a generic method, but then you want to tune it and tweak it, and uh, based on these building blocks, design new methods that are specific for a particular application. Brian Witchman, uh, retired. Um, your techniques seem very clever and definitely not brute force. Mm -hmm. uh, does that imply that you don't actually need much computing power or do you need a lot or what? Oh, you need a lot of computing power. Yeah, um, so basically in a large network, say thousands, tens of thousands, millions of nodes, basically you're, yeah, I try to identify all of these uh, 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 subsets of five nodes or four nodes and you count and compute on them and things like that. And the computational complexity of that is fairly high, uh, maybe order and fifth and fourth and things like that, which is actually not feasible if you would just do it sequentially. Now, what we often do to cope with that complexity is first exploit the sparsity of the data because the data is sparse, which means you don't have to look everywhere. You just look at the parts where there is data. You don't look at the parts where there's no data, right? And another thing is uh, uh, the beauty of this is that uh, all of these counts are independent of each other. So you can parallelize. that These problems are so-called embarrassingly parallel. So you can distribute uh, uh, processes over a cluster of machines and then get your results quickly. But that's a very good question. Complexity. Well, I mean, there are NP-hard problems. And you know these heuristics are trying to approximate problems that are not solvable, right? And of course, you're dealing with, with complexity with a lot of time. But uh, compute time, but we are doing our best. So far, it's okay. <laughs> we cannot complain. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Michael Hood, Imperial College London. Uh, may I ask a question about the potential long term impact of, of this kind of work and the results? So, in particular, in the data integration world, where pharmaceutical companies are looking at uh, sort of multiple uses of the same drug, and I'm wondering how this might sort of uh, uh, you know, interact with uh, approval processes, you know, uh, f Food and Drug Administration and so on and so forth? Uh, 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 well, I'm not a legislator, uh, so I cannot answer these questions very well. I think a long-term impact is potentially very large because, I mean, if we can just use the drugs that are already approved and just give them to different patients that can benefit from it, I think that that would be huge. And pharmaceutical companies are very interested in this. Uh, so uh, I expect there, there will be impacts there. But of course, data integration in general, even not in that domain, in other domains, uh, honestly, I think that's uh, the path to the future. Uh, mm. This is, I mean, wh why do we generate these data? Why do we invest all this money to generate them if we are not going to use them? Uh, to do something. So I think uh, the age of data integration is just beginning. Thank you. My name is Mr. Martin. I'm very much a layman here. Uh, all right, you say that some um, computations are so complicated, you just can't do it, uh, there's enough room in the in universe. So you produce a simplified version which works partially. The thought has passed my mind that you might need then a simplified version number two We're inside of that first one, simplified version number three uh, uh, go on indefinitely. Does that sort of make sense? You know, that you, even the simplified version doesn't work terribly well. Uh, if I understand your question, these uh, versions of the methods that we have will not work uh, in the future? Is that what you're, say you're saying? <clears throat> what I'm saying is uh, you're trying to uh, simplify very complex um, um, the data, and it's so complicated you can't do it normally, so you produce this better method, you understand, which gets an approximation of the results. But the trouble is approximation result might not be enough and you'd have to have a, a series oh. of approximations, one's inside another rather like a oh, Russian no, doll. No, 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 no. We, we don't do that, yes, we, we, we don't do that. I mean, um, we don't simplify the data, we analyze the data by approximate methods, okay? And mm. then uh, there are formal ways how you can test whether your methods are good mm. enough. One of them I've shown you, for example, of that data integration and how you increase in your confidence that your approximation is good by adding more data. So now, 
as you've seen, we can be 98% confident that our results are mm. correct, okay? So there would be a 2% error, but that's you know, the best we can do. I think 2% error is not, is not too bad. So we are, we are addressing those issues. But yeah, thank you, it's an interesting question. Okay, I'd like to bring um, the session of questions to a close. And in particular, you guys were brilliant. I didn't need to chivy you at all. <laughs> so, and I think some of that is a testament to uh, how well uh, Natasha gave her talk. And I'd like to invite um, Igor um, Yuriasiska back um, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, and uh, sorry that you have to deal with me again. Um, Alfonso Valencia is a good friend of mine, and uh, unfortunately, as mentioned, I mean, he has a family trouble because of which he had to cancel the trip. Uh, he is a current president of uh, International Society for Computational Biology, so it would be much more appropriate for him to thank Natasha for the very nice presentation and all the work and contribution to the field. But as I judge from the questions and multiple questions very well geared, I think it's, it's very obvious that all of you, uh, younger and older, are already thinking that you probably have to spend a little bit more time or maybe take a reading course on graph theory because everything from now on is going to involve some graphs. Being in social networks or computational biology networks, transportation networks, and so on. Um, it's also, I mean, go, listening to the lecture, it's interesting that I knew of all of the Natasha's work on the biological uh, side of the analyzing these networks, and I didn't really uh, follow her work on the business side or economics. But I think with all these uncertainties in terms of the funding that we get in academia, it's more than fitting that she looked into it because her research now can potentially suffice that she will be able to predict of how to increase her funding for her lab in the future. <laughs> Because finding to whom to connect to or how to look outside and see how the prices of all are, go all are going up, so who will be benefiting, and then uh, maybe changing her department and going into university in that country and hopefully have more funding. Uh, suffice to say that really it's the, the complexity of these networks and how they change uh, that is going to be both exciting and also it's kind of uh, scary almost. The more we know, the more we know what we don't know and how these networks will be changing in terms of the types, as the questions uh, also have alluded to. What are the edges? What's the implication of the edge? What's the weight of the edge? What's the presence of the edge in this instance versus that instance, in this patient versus that patient? And how this will be dynamically changing. Um, I think it's really now intertwining of these experiments with computational side and biology that will be the way of going forward because we had to do prediction do experiments, go backwards, and analyze, uh, in a sense, the results and move forward. And I'm really passionate and excited about it. And I can be talking about this for many hours. But uh, in a sense, it's, it's a weeknight. And I would tell my kids that it's a school night. You have to go to bed. So we should probably also uh, give a close to this uh, word of thanks. And I, again, would like to thank the audience for coming here. I uh, would like to thank Microsoft for supporting this research and uh, all the committee to giving this award to my first graduate student. So it makes me really proud like a father. Uh, <laughs> or, obviously, it's a different aspect than father, but it's my academic, I'm the academic father. Uh, then Natasha got this award. And uh, thank you very much. And hopefully, we'll have a good trip or journey home. Thank you. Thank you.